<laughs> Great. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to Regis and to the science session. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Carlos Hernandez Garcia. Um, so Carlos and I have known each other for quite some time. He is a uh, scientist, uh, a solar scientist in Jefferson Lab, where he has been working since 2001, uh, working on the on research and development of very high voltage uh, and ultra high vacuum and high pr uh, brightness photo emission electron sources. If these words don't make much sense to you just yet, don't worry. Uh, he's going to tell you all about it and, and his talk. Uh, he, he got a, his PhD from uh, Vanderbilt University just before joining uh, and Jefferson Lab. He, uh, so the reason why I've known him is because he's a, he's a great mentor, has been mentoring many people, many young scientists uh, throughout the years, both uh, through research experience programs here in the United States. And that's how I, I met him in 2006. I was his um, research student for a summer uh, and it was great and fun, hard work. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but he also has developed programs where he brings students from Mexico to do some uh, summer resource experience. So he's a, he's been a mentor to many, many students. Uh, and he is also a member of the Regis team, uh, which has made all these activities possible. So I'm uh, really happy to have Carlos join us and give this talk. So uh, thanks again, Carlos, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Raul. Thank you for that uh, uh, delightful introduction. And thank you to the uh, to the Reyes team for inviting me to participate in this uh, in this wonderful endeavor. It's, it's, it's a true pleasure uh, being able to talk to to all of you about a little bit of what we do at, at Jefferson Lab. Uh, what I what I uh, tell some of the students uh, uh, that come and visit us in the summer is that uh, the work that uh, uh, that I am particularly do has to do with the first few centimeters of the mile long accelerator. But it's, uh, uh, it's, it, I found it very, very interesting. I hope you find it interesting too. Um, I will be focusing on describing uh, some of the technical aspects about uh, generating electrons, in particular for electron accelerators. Uh, probably you already have had some, uh, some courses here in Reyes that talk about quantum mechanics and nuclear physics. And for some of those, uh, we use uh, very big machines, particle accelerators that are literally uh, miles long and have uh, uh, thousands and thousands of components. Some of them use, uh, 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 use protons, some of them use ions, but a lot of them uh, use electrons. And the kind of uh, uh, accelerator that we have here at Jefferson Lab uh, uses beam of polarized electrons. And this is, uh, um, how are we going to focus the, uh, uh, the talk today? On the, uh, on the right, uh, you can see an aerial view of Jefferson Accelerator. Uh, you can see this oval shape. This oval shape is, is the accelerator. It's underground, about three, three floors underground. So the shape that you see is what we call the service buildings, where all the equipment is, uh, is mounted that powers the accelerator. Uh, down here in the lower left corner is where it all begins. That's where we have the electron source. Uh, the electrons are extracted, are accelerated, and then they turn around, they are accelerated again, and they go like that about five times before they are diverted to one, two, three, and four experimental holes. Uh, here in the center, you see an schematic of the, of the uh, underground accelerator where the green cube is what we call the injector or the, or the electron source. We extract the electrons, we accelerate them, uh, you will see why in a minute, uh, uh, through, the, uh, 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 through one section of accelerator, and then we let them go around for a second set of acceleration. As you can see, rather than having this in an oval shape, we could have many, many accelerators in line, but because of many, many reasons in part uh, uh, practical in space, uh, back in the 80s, they devised this type of accelerator where the electrons just go round and round, until finally they get the energy that the uh, nuclear physicists need to do their experiments at uh, one of the experimental holes A, B, or C, or just recently added, hole D. If you were to take a tour underground of the accelerator, uh, the picture on the lower uh, left shows how would it look like. It's actually not very pretty. It just looks like, uh, like, like cans, 
giant cans, uh, probably about uh, two or three car lengths. Each of these can is called a cryo module. It's literally a linear accelerator. Why is it called cryo? Because Jefferson Lab is one of the unique uh, accelerators that uses um, superconductivity to, to power uh, the accelerator. And to obtain superconductivity, the internal components of the accelerator have to be cooled down to only two degrees Kelvin. That's, that's why it's called uh, a cryo module. But in these particular experiments, the electron or the electron beam is literally used as a microscope, as a point light probe uh, to, to impact on, on a specific targets that can be ca a carbon or hydrogen or gases to elucidate uh, what, is, what is inside the, uh, uh, inside the, um, uh, the nucleus. Electrons in accelerators find many other users outside nuclear physics. For example, many of them are used in what is called uh, light sources. In light sources, instead of having a beam of polarized electrons, we have a beam of unpolarized electrons. We also accelerate them. But in this case, instead of making the electrons smash onto something, we make them go in circles. But every time we make an electron that goes almost to the speed of light, and we ask the electron or we make the electron with an uh, with an um, uh, with a bending magnet to change direction that electron is going to create light it's going to generate x-rays or infrared depending on the energy of the electron and depending on how strong we kick the electron to one side this is called synchrotron radiation the electrons can also generate radiation when they are uh, when they make os uh, to oscillate in a series of alternating magnets. Imagine that you have is called a storage ring, essentially where the electrons go round and round, and and instead of having magnets bending them in the same direction, uh, we can we can set magnets uh, as an alternate field. This is called a, a wiggler or an oscillator, and this is very powerful because sometimes they put them. In, in, inside the, uh, uh, inside the uh, synchrotrons, like this one shown in Argo National Lab. And what happens is that when the electron comes almost at the speed of light, it's bent by one of the magnets, and then it's bent backwards, uh, and then forth and back and back and forth, until finally, if you are an observer at the end of this oscillating uh, 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 oscillatory structure, what you will see is light. But the interesting thing about this light is that it's actually coherent. So essentially, we can make a laser out of electrons. This is very powerful, like in the free electron laser at, uh, uh, in Hamburg and, and, uh, and the SLAC in Stanford, where they can now generate X-rays uh, that have the characteristics of laser light. And if you look at this, it's actually just like a radio antenna. In a radio antenna, uh, it's just, it's just a, a straight uh, structure up, and then the electrons oscillate back and forth, and they generate light. Or radio waves. But, uh, but what are electrons? Uh, we know they're uh, 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 particles that they're bound to atoms most of the time. And many, many people started to wonder from many, uh, many years ago what those were, um, uh, what those particles were. Uh, when, uh, when the Greeks started to, to rub uh, amber and, uh, and silk, they uh, discovered little flashes of light, sparks. And if you think about it, a lightning strike is just a giant spark. It's when electrons go from ground to the positively charged cloud. It's just that there's millions and millions of volts involved in, in jumping that, that, that high. On the, uh, on, on the picture, we see uh, Mr., uh, uh, Mr. Thompson, who discovered the electron. And at the beginning, the electrons were uh, not identified as, 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 uh, uh, as, as particulates. Uh, they were still trying to elucidate what they were. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways they call them, they call them cathodic rays, rays. Because the way they used to make the experiments was that they would have a, a, a hot filament, and they would put a, a, a negative voltage, very high voltage. That's why it's called the cathode. And then they would, they would make this mysterious substance go inside a, uh, uh, in, inside a, almost like a light bulb, uh, a, a, a vessel made of glass. And 
they fill this vessel with, uh, with certain gases, with uh, neon or with argon, as the electrons could be accelerated, uh, escaping the cathode, they would, uh, they would ionize the gas and the gas would make light. So essentially they could see rays going uh, through, the, uh, through the ionized gas. And if they were to put a magnet or another plate with an electric, flea, uh, with an electric uh, field, they would change the position of these, of these rays. Uh, uh, later on, it was then, of course, discovered that the electron was a, was a, 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 a particle. So the history of the discovery of the electron, the experimental and theoretical work is just, is just fascinating. And on top of that, the technology that had to be evolved to make these apparatus to extract the electrons, to make them go in the direction they want to go, we want them to go, and in particular to, to make the use that we, uh, uh, that we want from, uh, uh, from these uh, uh, particles is, is absolutely fascinating. There's of course no time to cover all that. And this is why we're going to focus on uh, getting electrons for accelerators. In general, in this talk, we're going to talk about electron emission as the process in which electrons that are bound in a solid are released and uh, leave the surface. If you think, for example, in a wire, in a wire connected to a battery. Let's say that we can have, that we see a, a giant, uh, that we could use a microscope and imagine that, that, that we can see the atoms in that copper wire, uh, illustrated here by these, uh, uh, by these uh, uh, buckyball shapes. Well, yes, the electrons are bound to the atoms, but not all of them. The electrons on the outer shells are, are jumping from atom to atom. They, 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 they just drift. Uh, one can say that in a metal, uh, the electrons behave as a, as a, as a free electron gas. As the, as the atoms were to be uh, immersed in this sea of electrons. So if we have a, a piece of copper, then the electrons are just bouncing back and forth. If we connect the battery with a positive on one side, negative on the other side, because the electrons are negative, the electrons will try to go away from the negative side and will be attracted to the positive side. If we were to have a battery, then we would have an electrical current. So the electrical current is no more than the average drift velocity uh, of, of, of the electrons. But where do, we de where do we get the electrons from and how do we get them out? As I mentioned, there are plenty of electrons in, in, um, um, in copper and in other metals. But for some accelerator applications, we need to extract the electrons in a very specific way. We need mainly four ingredients. One is the cathode. Essentially, it's a material from which we extract the electrons. It can be a piece of a semiconductor, that I will talk about that, or it can be a piece of metal. Then we need a source of energy to impart, to give to these electrons, so that they can go above the cathode force function. I will speak more about this, but essentially is the minimum amount of energy that an electron requires to escape the, uh, to, to escape the solid. It can be in the form of a, of a laser beam of, or light, or it can be in the form of heat. Once the electrons leave and just, let's say that they just hover on the surface of the, of the electrode, then we can, we can get them out of the electrode and into the system we want by applying an accelerating field. Essentially, we have our, 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 our cathode, and then we apply an accelerating field, and the electrons move, move away from the cathode, and then we can capture them. Uh, the, the accelerating field can be direct current, like in a battery, or it can be an oscillating electric field, like in a microwave, for example, or in radio frequency accelerators. Once we, once we apply that electric field, then, then the electrons move, uh, uh, move out and an accelerator. The, the other um, key ingredient is that we need to have a vacuum environment. This is important because the electrons scatter very easy in air. So let's say that we have a cathode and then we give it, uh, we illuminate with the proper laser and we give it a, 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 a voltage with a battery. The electrons will go out but will not get very far. The other issue is that in most accelerators, the photocathodes have very sensitive chemistry. That is, they get oxidized very easy. And if we 
oxidize the surface of the cathode or the, uh, or the particular material we're, we're using, then the electrons will require more energy and will not exit as easy as we want them to. There are three main mechanisms in which uh, an uh, electron can escape a solid. One of them is called field emission or cold emission. Imagine that, uh, 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 imagine, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the electrons are bound uh, to a solid by these kind of uh, uh, shapes, these great shapes. I will explain more about that later. Imagine that to the left of that shape is where the electrons live. They need sufficient energy to jump above this barrier. This barrier is called the work function or the vacuum level. In one, of the, uh, in one of the mechanisms, which is called field emission, if we apply an extremely high voltage, very high, very high voltage, this barrier that it was otherwise square, it becomes like a triangle. It thins, and then the electrons have certain probability, probability to escape. This happens when we have very, very sharp uh, uh, points. This is why we sometimes in winter time, uh, when we're walking around in a carpet and then uh, we touch something and then a spark jumps, that's because sometimes we touch with a, with a key or, 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 or with a, a, let's say, uh, with a fork, and then the electric field at the tip is very, very strong and the electrons just jump. The other mechanism is called thermal emission, in which the, uh, the cathode is heated uh, very, very high in the orders of thousands of Kelvin, and then the electrons gain sufficient thermal energy that some of them are able to escape. And the third one is photoemission in which we have a material, typically a, a metal, and then we have a, a light, certain type of light, because it needs to have sufficient uh, uh, energy. And by energy, I don't mean intensity. I mean the wavelength uh, of light. This is, this is behind, uh, um, behind, the, uh, um, uh, behind the photoelectric effect described by Einstein, in which the electrons they receive a photon, and if there are, uh, uh, if all the uh, uh, um, requirements uh, are filled, that photon has the probability to excite an electron above the uh, above the barrier. But in order for these mechanisms to work, we really need to choose or to focus on a particular uh, mechanism, and it really is driven by the requirements of each electron accelerator or device that, that we want, because no, there is no single source that can meet the requirements for all applications. For example, some of them require a constant stream of electrons, which is called DC beam, and others require a pulse beam. The electron microscope is an example that requires a constant stream of, of electrons or, 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 or DC. In this case, uh, uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the electron microscope has a very, very fine tip, about a nanometer size, and the strong electric field, it thins the potential barrier. So the electrons that are, uh, uh, that are in the metal bulk, they have certain uh, 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 quantum probability to tunnel, and this is how we get uh, electrons by field emission. If we want electrons a, a, a lot more electrons than the ones that can be generated by field emission, then we go to thermionic emission. Uh, X-ray equipment, widely used in, in medical applications, uh, it uses this type of device. On the, on the left-hand side is a schematic of an X-ray tube where, we have a, where there is a filament, just like a tungsten filament in one of the old lamps. We run a current and it heats up to thousands of Kelvin. And then on the opposite side, there is a piece of metal, typically tungsten, uh, that is actually uh, that it, uh, in which a very high voltage in the order of uh, 2,000 or 3,000 uh, uh, volts is applied. The electrons are extracted by this potential, are accelerated, and when they strike the piece of metal, uh, they suddenly decelerate and they create uh, X-rays. To the right is just a picture of one of these X-ray devices in glass, and of course uh, it's uh, uh, it's under vacuum. But most accelerators actually need electrons uh, or electron bunches in pulses. Uh, to the left, you can see uh, this comes actually from a computer simulation from about uh, 1,000 electrons. And we call this a six-dimensional phase space because, because the electrons uh, uh, are 
are like a like, like a balloon and all the electrons want to want to get away from each other because they have uh, the same uh, negative charge and this is why it's important to accelerate them to very high energies shortly after they are emitted from the cathode this is one of the uh, one of the uh, most fundamental uh, uh, problems in electron accelerators that we need to have that photocathode at very high potential and at very high uh, vacuum. If we use the proper uh, uh, excitation method, then we can generate electrons in pulses. And depending on the accelerator application, we have different pulse lengths and different number of pulses per second. For example, the, the most simple way to, to create a pulse of electrons is use a, a thermionic cathode, essentially a filament, and then uh, very close to that, uh, a few, a few uh, millimeters, then we put a, a, a grid, essentially a metal grid that we bias at a at high voltage uh, positive. The electrons are going to be extracted by the grid. They're going to go through the grid. And by pulsing that grid, then we can have uh, pulses of electrons. But these are kind of long for accelerator applications. They, they, they are milliseconds, and we cannot pulse that grid uh, very, uh, very often. Let's say that, uh, that we pulse it you know, 10 times a second, for example. There are more sophisticated ways in which a thermionic cathode uh, can, be, uh, can be utilized for, uh, for accelerators. On the, on, the, on the left, there's a picture of the, uh, of the free electron laser in Japan, which uses a thermionic cathode. It's only this, this little thing. You can see the, uh, the size compared to a pencil. But that small cathode is heated to almost 2,000 Kelvin. And the way uh, electrons are extracted is described in the, uh, in the uh, diagram on the, on the right. The, the, red, the red part represents the, the bulk of the metal, and the gray part represents where's, where's the vacuum. We want to get electrons from the red to the gray. Actually, we want to get electrons from the red above the gray part, because above the gray part is where, where electrons are free in the vacuum. Before applying any, any heat, all the electrons are below this line, be, below the Fermi energy. But as we apply heat, some of the electrons gain sufficient, uh, sufficient energy that sufficient uh, energy that they will start to, to gain more and more energy. And only a tail of them, only a fraction of them, will get sufficient energy to just escape uh, the vacuum. And this is where, in front of this cathode, actually, this cathode is placed in a, in, in, inside a, a vacuum. And inside that vacuum, there's a, a half a million volt uh, power supply to push the electrons out uh, and, and, and into the accelerator. But there's an even more sophisticated way to get electrons, and this is the most common type of electron accelerator in the world. Every electron accelerator in the, uh, for industrial and medical applications uses this principle, and it's called a radio frequency electron source. Uh, like, like, like the, uh, uh, it uses almost, uh, a heated element as the thermionic cathode, and it uses a special shape of a uh, vacuum chamber. And this shape is special because when we introduce electromagnetic waves or microwaves, the shape of the chamber uh, makes the electric field be longitudinal or perpendicular uh, to, to the cathode surface and then extracts the electrons. What happens is that this field is oscillating in time at a very high frequency. It can be, it can be oscillating in the, in the megahertz uh, regime. And now every time the electric field is sufficiently high, it will extract a pulse of electrons that will ride on the, uh, uh, on the electromagnetic wave. And in this manner, we can extract pulses that are now nanosecond, which are orders of magnitude shorter than what can be achieved uh, with a grid. But this, but this part of, uh, 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 but this way to, 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 generate, uh, to generate electrons has uh, its, uh, its limitations because this can be on for only a certain amount of, uh, amount of time. We can generate these waves uh, in megahertz, but only, but only uh, uh, for, let's say, 100 microseconds, and then, and then, uh, and then we, um, and, and, and then, and then, um, and then they have to be turned off, and then turn back on, and turn back on. 
Another example of generating a pulse electron beam, but using actually DC fields, is called a, 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 a DC photoelectron gun. And in this case, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the picture here shows the, the electron gun for the, uh, uh, for the Jefferson Lab free electron laser. It's, it's very, very shiny because it was polished by hand with diamond paste because it's held uh, at almost half a million volts. In the center is the photocathode, which is a piece of semiconductor. When pulses of light strike the, se the semiconductor, they create pulses of electrons. And because this is biased at negative voltage, the electrons go and, and escape and go into the accelerator. In this, in this case, because we use laser light, we can generate pulses that are picosecond long. And we can generate them truly at megahertz of frequency. This is a cut away of, of one of the other electron guns in Jefferson lab. We can see this sphere here, and uh, this red dot at the center is the photocathode. We can inject the laser beam uh, through one side, the laser beam exits, and the electron beam pulses go to the accelerator through the middle. And on the right, is, you can see another example of, the, uh, uh, of one of the of one of the uh, electrodes uh, that we use at Jefferson Lab. And yet, there's another type of, uh, of electron source for, uh, uh, for accelerators. And this one also uses lasers, but instead of using a, a DC field, it uses an oscillating field. So this combines the best of, wor of both worlds. It combines the radio frequency characteristics of a thermionic uh, radio frequency injector, but, it, but instead of exciting the electrons with a hot cathode, we, we excite the electrons out from a semiconductor, again illuminated with laser pulses. This time, the laser pulses fire in synchrony with the maximum uh, uh, sinusoidal field to extract, to extract the electrons. This is very advantageous because we can generate uh, electrons at very high, very high frequencies the, the only disadvantage is that most of the photocathodes that have been uh, uh, used in these type of accelerators have a very low uh, response or very low uh, quantum efficiency. Uh, this is another, another example where, uh, uh, where you can see the structure uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the radio frequency injector. Here in the back is where we would put the, the photocathode. Uh, these are just ports to, uh, uh, for pumping and some are used to, to inject the, the radio frequency. And on the left, you can see that there's plenty of uh, computer simulation in order to make one of these. If we focus on, on the photocathode aspect, there are many, many uh, avenues for research here. The lower left is a picture of one of the cathodes that we used and destroyed almost at the, at, at the, at the free electron laser in in Jefferson lab, and you can see the amount of energy, it literally obliterated the surface. But there are many, uh, uh, many, many uh, research all around the world on semiconductor technology, on surface science and computational physics, trying to devise or even trying to make a new type of material that can tailor the emission of electrons for a particular accelerator. Even even uh, that there are uh, uh, accelerators for specific uses and the requirements for electron beam are very different from those to make x-rays, for example, or for industrial applications, every accelerator requires different electron beam parameters. And this is why scientists uh, are trying to tailor a material that can produce the, the, the electron bunches with the characteristics that the accelerator needs. And this is uh, strongly coupled to the uh, laser beam development. Because in order to get the electrons, we need to shape the electron beam, not only temporally, but also in time, in such a way that when the laser pulse interacts with the material, and then the electrons interact inside the material, interact with other electrons in the material, that we get the electron pulse that, that, that we want. There are, there are many, many opportunities for research in, uh, in, in how to uh, best couple the, the laser to the material properties and in turn to the, to the proper uh, electron source for the accelerator. So as you can see, the future in particle accelerators is bright, continues to be very bright, 
And even just thinking about, about the first few centimeters of accelerators, you can see that there are many research opportunities that even though the photocathodes have been around for, uh, uh, for many, many decades for accelerators and, 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 and many more for other applications, there are still a lot of fundamental questions that, uh, that, that, we, need to, that we need to solve. And we want to, when we want to address the fundamental questions, the physics questions, then is when we have to address the technological questions and how do we solve those? And everything becomes a circle. So uh, thank you very much for, for your attention and I'd be delighted to answer any questions uh, you may have. Great, thank you so much, Carlos, uh, for a really nice talk. So let me encourage people out there to send your questions uh, in the video chat. There's a little uh, part where you can ask questions. Um, they could be questions about the content of the presentation, or there could be any questions about uh, Carlos himself, about his, uh, his background and experiences. Um, I should have mentioned that he, uh, oh, and I just lost this information. Let me pull it back up. Uh, but he got his undergraduate. Where did you get your undergraduate, Carlos? Uh, I, I went to uh, uh, Monterrey Institute of Technology in Mexico. Good. Yeah, so we have a lot of people from Mexico. So perhaps, you know, some of you might be interested in hearing about uh, his experience going from Mexico here to the States and now being a, um, a researcher in a national lab in the United States. So feel free to ask whatever questions you want. There are already several. So let me start reading some of them for you uh, and you sure. can start addressing them. Um, so we had one from uh, Jesus Alberto Perez Verga, uh, Vargas. Uh, from Mexicali, Mexico, saying, do you, do you use helium for the, cry, for the cryo? Yes, yes, we use helium for the, uh, for the cryogenics. Well, I said we, but it's really they. There's, there's a whole group of people that, it, that just are, are dedicated to cryogenics, and uh, they compress helium, and by compression is how they can get to 2 Kelvin. It's, it's liquid helium. So through the accelerator, it flows uh, liquid helium. Not for the not for the uh, electron source, but uh, but for the rest of the accelerator. Am I remembering this correctly? Do we have the largest amount of liquid helium in the world in Jefferson Lab? Is this right? Um, it's it's very likely. Yes, they they're just expanding the the plant. Uh, so the the plant uh, requires many megawatts to 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 uh to compress the helium and to and to cool it down i believe that uh that the scientists and uh, and engineers here at jefferson lab um uh, were participating in uh in the design for the refrigeration of the web space telescope so these these people know a lot about liquid helium <laughs> yeah got it uh maybe some, for some context out there for folks so Carlos works at Jefferson Lab. I do too, but I work on the theory side. So uh, we work on the opposite side of, yes. the, of the lab, which is a big lab. I think people don't have a sense of the scale of the lab. Is you know it's the size of a small university or so. So, um, but okay. So let me read some of the other questions that we're seeing. So I have a question from Brian Go from Indonesia, saying, uh, "Why do we accelerate uh, electrons?" And what is the advantage and disadvantage of using electrons versus ions or molecules or any other or atoms in general? Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the, the question kind of goes on a little bit, but, um, but that's the spirit of the question. Yes. So there are many accelerators in the world. Uh, some of them accelerate protons. Some of them accelerate uh, uh, ions, like argon ions or even gold ions. Uh, uh, some of them accelerate electrons. And it really depends on the physics that, that you want to study. Uh, for example, um, Jefferson Lab uh, is now one of the only two remaining accelerators in the world that uses a beam of electrons and a beam of polarized electrons. Uh, so, you know, in uh, here I specialized in electrons because at the time I was, uh, I was doing my, my PhD thesis. We, we wanted to use electrons to make light, to make a, a, a small free electron laser. 
uh, and then and then it evolved into going to Jefferson Lab, which uses electrons too. But for example, if I had follow a, a, a different path, uh, one of my one of my uh, summer students uh, actually back in 2009, he did his PhD for uh, uh, working with a source of ions at CERN, and now he's an expert in designing uh, ion sources at CERN. And and we have some commonalities, right? The the the, the vacuum, the accelerating systems, etc. So there's really no advantage or disadvantage. It really depends on the physics you want to study. Good. Let me let me answer a follow up question. So you you mentioned a lot of opportunities for young people to do research and continue on. Um, we recently had the approval of the electron ion collider in Brookhaven National Lab. Um, are there uh, uh, people on, you know, people working on the accelerator side in collaboration with the, with the electron ion collider and what are the types of, you know, are some of the expertise that we've learned in Jefferson lab, are they going to be adopted there as well? Yes, there are, there are many, many technologies, not only uh, be, because the electron ion collider is literally like two, two giant accelerators. Uh, one of them is going to be using ions. Uh, which which uh, uh, Brookhaven uh, uh, has a very large uh, uh, accelerator for that, and the other one is for electrons. Essentially, it would be almost like like getting like like obtaining the electrons at GeV energies out of out of Jefferson Lab and making it collide. Uh, there are many many opportunities and many many challenges. I am only aware of some of those related to the electron source. For example. One of the one of the uh, uh, particular applications was to use an electron beam to cool or reduce the transverse energy of the ion beam. If you imagine the ion beam, it could be like a cloud, but we wanted to make it a, like a solid rod. We we want the we want the uh, the momentum of those of those ions to be as uh, uh, in the for, as much in the forward direction as possible. Turns out that there's a technique that is called uh, electron cooling in which you can embed the ions uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, in a, in an electron beam very close to it and the energy of the ions will get transferred to the to the uh, to the uh, electron beam essentially it's almost like like cooling off the the uh, uh, the ion beam with an electron beam and then you can throw the electron beam that is call it hot now the issue is that to make that to work we need to produce an electron beam made of pulses, made of bunches, which have an unprecedented amount of electrons. So at the moment, we're just devising the type of photocathode that can produce that amount of electrons 24 seven with minimum degradation of the material in order to provide these, uh, these characteristics. So yes, there are, there are many, many opportunities and there's, there's a tremendous synergy between, between Brookhaven and JLab uh, in these sometimes we do an exp we do a, one test that complements one of the experiments. Some of sometimes they do another test, and 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 we publish a lot. We review between ourselves a lot, and 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 it's a very good synergy. That's great. So that's awesome. And and you mentioned a lot of uh, about the, a lot of research opportunities for young people. I mean, it sounds like this is still a very vibrant and exciting field, um, which I would second. Um, uh, do you maybe want to take a second to, uh, you know, you are, you've developed this program bringing students from Mexico over the summer. You know, we have a lot of people from Mexico involved in this calls. Um, how do you, you know, how do people get involved in that? How can they be, uh, how, you know, how do we make them aware and how could they participate if they, if they want to be, see if they're eligible? Sure. Uh, so this, this program uh, uh, started uh, back in 2009. Uh, but it's based on, a, on, on an established program between, uh, uh, between uh, national labs here in the U.S. And, uh, and, and, and universities. It's called Research Experience for Undergraduates. Uh, you participated in one of those when you were an undergraduate, so uh, 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 you know you can tell more about the, about the process in doing that. But in the particular case of Mexico, now we have an, uh, 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 an, an agreement between, Mex between JLab and the Mexican Physical Society. The Division of Particles and Fields of the Mexican Physical Society has every year, um, uh, I think it's called a, a, a contest or a, or, or, or a, 
uh, or a training session in which they they call out all of the students in uh, in physics that are in their last year of uh, of college or university. Uh, they apply. I, I'm not sure what are the uh, 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 the rules, but once they get accepted into that program, which is very very select, uh, only maybe 60 or 80 students get to go for three days, and then they get uh, courses, pretty much like what what they are getting here in Reyes, but only only compressed and very focused to physics. Then they get a test, and they select uh, only uh, uh, three to five students. And depending on where they want to go, what research they want to, to do, some of them go to uh, go to Fermilab or CERN, or in our case, they come to Jefferson Lab. And the idea is that um, the students come for 10 weeks over the summer and participate along with the students from all over the country in this research experience for undergraduates, in particular here at JLab. Um, and, 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 and we have, uh, have had a, a grant by uh, Jefferson Science Associates, uh, which allows us to cover uh, uh, meals and, uh, and lodging at, at no cost to the student. And the student's institution uh, covers the, uh, 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 the plane ticket. So we have this, this established program, and, and, and every year I get contacted by the, peop by the people of the Division of Particles uh, and Fields, saying, hey, you know, we have our candidate for this year, and then I interview them, we invite them, and we go with the process. It's, it's been very, very successful. That's great. Um, so let me read some of the other questions that we've been getting. Um, so let me maybe tie to this comment uh, that you already, uh, you know, to this answer that you brought us. Um, Maria Hernandez Flores from Mexico City. Uh, said, hi, uh, I just wanted to thank you for the talk. It was really interesting and easy to follow. Also, I wanted to con congratulate Carlos to keep inviting Mexican students to research at JLab. My question is, is about the applications for the results, technology and tools developed during the research process, uh, even if they're not uh, useful for keep doing certain research. So I think uh, maybe the question is asking, uh, what are some of the the tools and technologies that are developed either directly for the research or byproducts of the research um, in particular. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, this is this is a very nice uh, a very nice nice question. And as you can see, just just describing the 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 electron gun, the, the one we have at Jefferson Lab, it involves um, ultra high vacuum, uh, ultra high voltage, it involves lasers, uh, Surface physics, not only because of the vacuum, but also because of the chemistry going on in the photocathode. Of course, high voltage engineering. And behind all of that, you need, I mean, if, if you really, if you were a student or a graduate student, that you would participate in a project, you would, you would work directly with a mechanical engineers, with mechanical technicians, because you will learn how to, you know, how to handle uh, the cleanliness and the materials. Uh, and most importantly, the computational tools are, are an essential part of this. And it depends, it's, it's, it's so, so specific in, in, in certain areas of the electron gun that, that you can choose uh, uh, one or two or different computational tools. One that we use all the time is uh, uh, tools which allow us to model the entire structure and look at the electric fields and the potentials. And this is very important to make sure that literally we do not have an arc, that we don't destroy the system by applying high voltage. Other tool that we use is, uh, uh, is uh, a beam dynamics in which we use Monte Carlo uh, approaches and particle in cells where, where we put those fields that were generated with the, with the modeling tools into a particle tracking uh, 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 software in which now you can tell it, okay, my laser beam has these characteristics and then the electron pulse, it, it can predict how the electron pulse will evolve. So the skills that the students get by, by participating, even in these just first centimeters of the accelerator, right? It's just, uh, it's, it's just phenomenal. Essentially, you know, they learn a lot of, uh, about computational, about, uh, about analysis, and about how to tie those results to to the actual piece of equipment, because it's just it's just very different looking at a 
looking at a hunk of, of a steel or a cable and thinking that from that, from everything that you did methodically, from the design to the construction to the assembly, has to work just right to get the electrons in the way the accelerator scientists need them 10 centimeters after all that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, so here, let me, let me read you some other questions. So we have a question from Alejandro Campo from Spain asking if you have any recommendation for educational resources uh, for people that want to learn quantum mechanics. Uh, so if you want to send me some recommendations, I can pass them on to, mm -hmm. to the students. Um, so, so Alejandro, we'll, we'll get back to you about that. Um, then we have another question that I think is really interesting uh, from Luis Angel uh, Vergara Ortiz from Hidalgo, Mexico, asking, can this technology be used in any way to fight against the coronavirus? Or is there any, I know there's, there's applications in, in accelerators in medicine. Um, and so my first reaction was probably not for the coronavirus, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure the, some of the applications in, in, in medicine uh, require uh, x-rays, not only for diagnosis, right? For example, in, uh, in sterilization. Many of the of the uh, uh, of the surgical objects and uh, uh, that are used, they actually go uh, and they are they are doused with X-rays, and most of, of those X-rays come from an accelerator. Why from an accelerator? Well, why, and not just an X-ray machine like from the from the one we use at the doctor office. It's because of the energy. Um, in the doctor's office, the energy of those X-rays is limited to to the to the power supply, which is about 100 kilovolts. But if you use an accelerator that can give you uh, uh, 10 megavolts, then that means that the X-ray, the wavelength of the X-ray is going to be smaller. And then that can have a very different biological effect on the sample that you, that you want to treat. Uh, how effective specifically for the coronavirus, I couldn't, I couldn't answer. But, you know, generating electrons certainly for to, to generate x-rays or even or even just generating the electrons uh, uh, and, and 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 to treat certain materials uh for example for food sterilization that is widely used in which in which you have a conveyor belt and then the electrons actually come out of the accelerator and then they scan uh the piece the piece the piece of uh, for directly with electrons not with x-rays and and that seems to to be, to be very uh very very effective too mm. Yeah, and I was, also, I was also thinking in the context of proton therapy, right? So there you also use accelerators for, for medical purposes. Exactly. It's somehow related to the, to the question earlier, why, why do we accelerate electrons and not something else? It depends on the application. In terms of proton therapy, it's a proton accelerator. It uses the same accelerating principles as an electron accelerator, but, uh, but, but it accelerates protons. Yeah, and I mean, it's also maybe worth mentioning that we have a uh, a proton therapy institute here uh, close by Hampton University. Yes. So, um, good. Okay. Interesting answer to an interesting question. Um, and, and so here's another question related to the materials of electron sources. So this comes from uh, Rene Fer uh, Rene Fernandez Pinoza uh, Gutierrez de Ensenada, Mexico, asking what are the material what other materials can be used. Uh, in an electron source. Mm -hmm. uh, there are actually not many materials that can be used. The most common and most relatively simple material uh, uh, and, and widely used, if you want to use it as a, as a, as a, as a photocathode, that means, let's say that you want to, to use a, a pulse of uh, a, a laser uh, pulse and, 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 and strike the surface, is actually copper. Uh, is a single crystal copper, highly polished. But what is called the quantum efficiency, that means how many photons do you need to get an electron is, is very, very small. However, there are the, 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 um, uh, the state-of-the-art accelerator for the state-of-the-art free electron laser in Stanford uses that type of photocathode. Other types of photocathodes, like the one we use in Jefferson Lab, 
is uh, is based on a semiconductor called uh, 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 gallium arsenide, and we use a semiconductor because we need to generate the electron beam. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, the electrons have to be polarized, and in that semiconductor, by by uh, uh, by quantum mechanics, we select one of the states of the uh, of the electron available to tunnel, and that's why we have to use a, sem a, se a semiconductor. There are other types of semiconductor cathodes. Uh, cesium, potassium, and timonite is, is another one that, that, that we can make. Uh, but that one, that one is good because it's very robust. You can illuminate with a lot of light, and it will give you lots of electrons, uh, but it cannot generate polarized electrons. So this is just you know, a, few, a few of the, uh, uh, of the many that, that, that can be used. And, and, and intermionic cathodes, just like you know, like tungsten filaments or or, or lanthanum uh, and, and barium, there there are many other combinations that can sustain very high temperatures and remain stable. Gotcha. Yeah, I was also wondering about. I mean, I didn't know there was that much restriction, um, but I was also wondering that I remember in the project that I did with you. Uh, you were trying out a new a new film on the on the electron gun. Is yes. that is that a uh, still a line of research where people? It, it seems like it would be on the on the fringe of material science. Um, are it still there investigations of other materials that might be better for creating different? You know, perhaps the vacuums and the guns or. Mm -hmm. In terms, in terms of material of material research, I think that uh, that they have accomplished a. a, a a, a significant amount of uh, 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 they, they they have accomplished a recipe which can give them the best pumping uh, speed. It's a combination of titanium, vanadium, zirconium, and it's, it's widely used. There are there are now companies that 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 coat the chamber and the tubes. The uh, uh, some of the European accelerators, all of the all of the tubing inside the accelerator is coated. With this uh, uh, material, and this material provides pumping. Essentially, it acts as a, as a chemical sponge, because because uh, the titanium and vanadium are very reactive. When there's when there's an, uh, a, a, a helium or a hydrogen atom, it just goes and sticks to the to the chamber. The interesting thing about the about the material research is that it's still very difficult to obtain a film that doesn't crumble. That doesn't pulverize, that it sticks very well to the vacuum chamber, right? And and that's that's part of the material. So like like the best of of, of two worlds, I want something that it is is like a paint, but uh, very very stable. But uh, but there's still ongoing ongoing research. Gotcha. Oh, interesting. Um, I think this ties nicely to another question that uh, we got from uh, Alan Alejandro. Uh, Garcia Gallegos from Mexicali, Mexico, saying, good afternoon. I'm curious to know in which field of physics it is needed for someone to study accelerator par uh, uh, accelerators of particles. So it seems like maybe the question more broadly can be casted as uh, what different fields of physics come together to build perhaps all the accelerator parts or, you know, maybe the ones that you, you know, the, the electron gun. How many, you know, or not just physicists, scientists in general, because I'm sure exactly. there's engineers. Mm -hmm. Exactly, scientists and engineers. Um, it is it's really, it's really, really broad, and and I think that the that the answer is, if you are passionate about a about a certain uh, field in physics or engineering, and if you want to participate in in accelerators, there's a, there's a place, because for example, in Jefferson Lab. There is there is the uh, uh, like what you were saying the cryogenics group right and they have experts in mechanical engineering in uh, in pressure systems in thermal systems etc cetera, etc cetera. so they have like ten different disciplines and that is only one of ten groups in Jefferson Lab then you go to the magnets right because we we use magnets to bend the electron beam and the magnets can be from the conceptual design of creating creating the the, the proper shape. Uh, to give you the strength, uh, the, the the magnetic field strength, doing computational physics, putting into the into the uh, beam dynamics code, and it can go all the way to to the to the electrical engineering. Say, how many amps do we need to run this? What's the design 
need to be in order to 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 transport that much current without without uh, destroying the magnet what's the what's the quality of the power supply so that the magnetic field is not oscillating and again just in magnets there are about 10 different disciplines all the way from from uh, uh, from phds in, uh, in 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 beam dynamics and electrical engineering uh, to technicians actually devising the the ways to hook up the wires right mm -hmm. so yeah. I, I would say if you want to get into accelerator physics follow your heart to to what you what you want to do and then knock on the door and the accelerator and say hey you know i know how to do this i would like to participate in an accelerator yeah great um maybe uh, we got a couple more minutes so let me wrap it up with one last question uh which i think is quite nice this comes from jamie vasquez madera hate me i'm here um sorry if i mispronounce your first name from ponce puerto rico the question was in spanish but i'm going to translate it um for our viewers uh the last thing that um uh, jamie mentions is that they want to thank us uh about this talk uh because they were really excited to hear about it since you know to hear the talk since they heard about it but the actual question is what is the thing in your research that uh you accomplished that you're most proud of uh, uh, wow! <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, it's it's been uh, um, it's it. I've been here almost for uh, almost for for twenty years, and uh, uh, and and at the beginning, I was uh, I was uh, helping with the electron gun for the uh, for the free electron laser, which uses electrons unpolarized to make to make a, a laser light, not to not to uh, uh, impact on on targets. And, and we had very big challenges in terms of generating very, very high voltages, close to half a million volts without breaking the electron source. And, and, and we were uh, literally uh, uh, exploring new possibilities. And finally, we were able, uh, after some experimentations and some modeling, we were able to come with some, uh, with some solutions. And, I was I was very proud when we finally were able to produce one of the first uh, uh, demonstrations of a very high charge electron bunch uh, from this type of from this type of gun. Uh, now is now is routine. Now they produce it at uh, at Cornell and uh, and produce it at, uh, uh, at at Brookhaven, which is which is key for this uh, uh, electron cooling that you mentioned. And uh, and the other thing that I I find uh, a lot of passion in it, even though the electron gun has, you know, all these thin different disciplines and we get to know about vacuum and, and lasers and this and that. Somehow, I have somehow, you know, the technology has guided me towards high voltage engineering. So I have learned a lot about high voltage engineering from the ground up, because every time that I had through that, I tried to reach to experts. Uh, they were all retired or I couldn't get anything. And it turns out that most of the research comes from papers that are dated uh, from, the, from the 60s and 70s. And then there's a big gap in the 80s and 90s. And it's like, it was literally up to a few of us in the field that went and, and tried to redo what they, had, what they did. Uh, and, and now it's interesting because we're getting contacted by other, we have published a few papers and we have contacted, been contacted by other companies and other labs around the world and say, hey, this is really cool. Can you help us, right? So I, th I think, I think this, is, this, is, this is very proud that other people with totally unrelated fields that they need high voltage applications are reaching out to us. Uh, but we're really not doing anything groundbreaking the only thing that we're doing is just applying what the what the engineers did back in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very fascinating. High voltage is a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I think that's generally true, right? We all have to work hard to maintain the knowledge alive through mm -hmm. time. So yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, with that, thank you again so much, Carlos. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us for the session. Um, just one reminder. If you're interested to hear a little bit more about the programs that we have related to Jefferson Lab in Mexico, we're going to have a panel in early August, uh, I believe it's August 3rd, 
where we're going to talk about a related program where we're bringing students from Mexico. And so we're going to have a panel from the students that have uh, come in that program. Uh, so thank you again so much, Carlos. This was a lot of fun. Um, and... Thank you, Raul. It, it, it was, it was uh, delightful. And uh, uh, thank you to everybody for listening and for the uh, uh, really, really exciting questions. All right. Thank you, everybody.